now it's recording. Um, we've already done our prayer, um, but we are in our last lesson in Jude, lesson five. It is a short book and a book filled with so much stuff. Um, I, I believe we could have spent another five weeks in this book uh, easily. But today we want to go over this last lesson last day, as we um, have looked at the first part of Jude and all, all, I mean, almost all of Jude so far, we want to remember like, what is it about? Who wrote it? Why it was written? Why is it important to us? Why is it relevant to today? Um, so this is a book that we know is written as a letter or an epistle, as we call it. Um, epistles or letters are always from someone and to someone, and it can be groups, um, so not just individuals. In this case, um, who wrote it? And who was it written to? Well, it was Paul that wrote it. Mm, not Paul. Paul oh. wrote a lot of epistles, but he didn't write this one. <laughs> Jude. 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 Yeah, Jude wrote it. And he wrote it to a non-specific group. I mean, it's not like a town or a place or even named people, but we know it is written to a specific group. And that group, how would you describe the group that it was written to? So it's to those who are called. Yes. So these, we might say, well, called beloved and kept is what verse one says. Um, and we know throughout the, the epistle that we could also describe these as believers, saints, um, you know, various words, because it's even saying in the end of verse three, um, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude being a saint, us being saints. Now, understand the word saint is not the word that um, a particular group has made it into being, which is like a special class of and characterized by and ordained or whatever. Um, saints are just believers, people that God has set apart. That's what the word means. The word comes from the same idea of sanctification, holiness. Um, so we're saints. Um, and when we use the word biblically, we can say that. When we use the word culturally, we probably wouldn't say that. <laughs> um, but if you have the faith, if you have the spirit, if you are set apart, if you're a called, a beloved, and a kept in Jesus Christ, as this says, then you're a saint. And that's who Jude is writing to. But it doesn't tell us that it's to a town with a church. It's not necessarily to one specific group of people in that sense. Um, and he had a purpose in writing, but his original purpose was he thought he was going to write about their common salvation, uh, meaning they're all saved, and he is too. Um, he was writing to a group that are, he believes are saved, but instead, what did he decide, what did the Holy Spirit lead him to write about instead? To warn them about the, uh, the people that creep in and want to and don't believe yes um he he talks about the people who've crept in unnoticed um meaning among them and that um they have turned the grace of god into licentiousness and they deny our only master and lord and throughout the rest of the book we can easily characterize them as ungodly unsaved not believers and many other descriptive words. Um, and he's telling the people he's writing to, he's warning them about those, like Martha said, but he's also telling them that as a result, basically, he need, they need to contend earnestly for the faith, um, that faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Um, so there's, there, we could hang out here for a long time, but we want to go on because he uses various things through this book, um, through this epistle to help understand this. He uses Old Testament examples of comparisons of Old Testament examples to this group of people because he gives comparative words like just as or in the same manner. Um, he uses those words in both or in the same way in verses seven and eight. So the Old Testament examples were of angels, were of Sodom and Gomorrah, were of the un, those that didn't believe but were part of the Israelites coming out of Egypt. And then he tells that this, 
this group of people also defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile angelic majesties. And then he does a comparison that's a, it's a uh, contrast with Michael, the archangel, who while, can, while fighting or arguing over the um, body of Moses, didn't feel he could pronounce a railing judgment. Instead, he said, the Lord rebuke you. So we need to see that contrast and see that Michael, who has more power than we have, Michael, who has a higher position than we have currently, currently, remember, we're created a little lower than angels, according to the Hebrews. Um, and Michael has that position of the guardian of Israel. And he also has the position in Revelation as being the one that's going to fight with angels against the devil and his angels. So this is a powerful angel. He's an archangel. And he did not feel it was his place to pronounce that reviling judgment. So we should not is what we need. One of the things we need to take from that. And then it talks about these men reviling things they don't understand, and they act on basically just unreasoning animals, animalistic uh, instincts is what we would call it, not thinking. Um, they just react and act on those things. And it says, woe to them. Re and it, it contrasts, I mean, it compares the ungodly people to Cain, to Balaam, and to Korah. And we looked in the Old Testament. So these are all a lot of Old Testament references and Old Testament um, examples for us. Then he gives current examples of like hidden reefs and um, what carried along by wind, uh, uh, sorry, clouds carried along by winds without water, autumn leaves, autumn trees, sorry, uh, without fruit, doubly dead and uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up their foam, wandering stars for whom the dark, black darkness has been reserved forever. So these are all these descriptive ways for us to understand who this group of people are, what they do, how they act. And then there's the um, mention of the prophecy from Enoch. And again, that would be, uh, Enoch is an Old Testament character person, literal person, that was, he was the one that was assumed or caught up to God, but he had warned about the judgment coming for these ungodly. Um, then he turns to um, more like New Testament, like remember what the apostles, the apostles of Jesus Christ told, and um, remember those words spoken beforehand. So when we look at our, um, what we can look at today kind of two categories we're going to look at what i'll look at what we are to do and then also what god will do So I've already mentioned one, and that is the word remember. We are to remember, and it shows up in uh, verse five as um, I desire to remind you. And those are those Old Testament references or examples. And then later it talks about, in verse 17, remembering the words spoken by the apostles. Oops, I did not spell that right. So this would be New Testament. So Old Testament and New Testament, um, people speaking words from God about this group of people in this time. And again, we've gone through some of what the Old Testament references were. The apostles talked about um, that, that they were saying there'll be mockers during this time. And those mockers are going to follow after their own ungodly lusts. And they're going to be worldly minded 
they're going to cause divisions, and they're going to be devoid of the spirit. So there's absolutely no doubt that what we're being warned about, what Jude was warning this group of people about, and, and later us about, is this type of person. So there's no doubt. We've looked in previous lessons that there's also no doubt about their condemnation. Punishment, condemnation, judgment to start is certain. And ultimately it's eternal. It's absolute, it's going to happen. And the consequences of that last, I was gonna say forever, cause that's the right way, but you can't even put it in the context of time because there is no time in eternity. So these people are certain. And if we're being war warned about them and also, also like what Martha was saying, they crept in unnoticed, they're among us. They're among the people that Jude is warning uh, about these people. And so it's, we have to stop and say, what are we to do? And first we're to remember, we're to remember these examples, we're to remember the characterization, we're to remember because we can, we can use that and understand this group of people. And in those Old Testament examples, all of those impacted others, all of those examples, people died, people were killed, the influence was vast. Like if you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, in that entire two city and surrounding area, I don't know how many people there would be, but it, if, not, if not hundreds, thousands, maybe even as much as a million, I honestly don't know. But um, if you recall, when Abraham was speaking to the one that we realized it looked like a man, but we realized was maybe a pre-incarnate Jesus, you know, talked about the Lord and the two angels went off. Abraham asked, would you save the city if there were, and he went down all the way to 10 people there. And he was told, yes, I will spare the city if there are 10 righteous people in there. He started out at a higher number and came down. The only people that left were Lot and his wife, and his two daughters, not even their fiancés. They didn't even get up to six. So the impact on Lot's soul was that it grieved him. We saw that in a cross-reference that whole time in the area where he was living. It grieved him. And apparently he was preaching. He was trying to. You don't see it in the Genesis account, but you see it in the New Testament account. And, and when he went to his sons-in-law, or fiancéed, sons-in-law, future sons-in-law, they wouldn't listen to him. They thought he was crazy or thought he was silly or whatever, and they wouldn't leave. So only four left the city. And even at that, his wife turned to look back when she was told not to, and she turned to a pillar of salt. So only three survived. And then let's not even get into what the daughters did, because that's not good at all. <laughs> um, but just think about the influence on those daughters, even though they left with their father, the influence was there from living in that town. So the same thing we need to take in consideration is Jesus prayed in the, what we call the high priestly prayer in the garden that we're in the world and he's leaving us here. You know, he was leaving the people that were alive at the time, but he also says this about us, the people that have yet to be born. When Jesus is praying this prayer, us, we're left in the world, but he prays that we'll be one with he and the Father. And being one with he and the Father would be kept from the ways of the world, within the world. So we're not to go to some compound and isolate ourselves away and never have contact with people around us. We're not really even supposed to just be around others just like us, although that is hugely important. We're not to forsake the fellowshipping, but because that's where we get edified, that's where we get educated, that's where we get poured into and maybe filled back up to go back out and do it again but we're supposed to leave that building and go into the world and carry our light, if that's your candle, carry your light into the world and not cover it with a bushel, all of those things. So that's part of 
what we are to do. And, but understand that in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul writes from God that we're to not judge the world because the world's going to do what the world is going to do. We used to be like that. And it's not our place to say, stop doing what you're doing because you're unsaved and you're of the world. But as when we're looking at those that are saved or the so-called brethren, the ones that come to our churches and sit in our buildings, read this in 1 Corinthians 5, it, Paul calls them the so-called. In other words, they call themselves saved. Those we are supposed to judge and to hold to the standards of scripture. Not because we like that and not because we want to run around pointing fingers at people, mainly because of what we're learning here in Jude, because there's other people in that group that are going to be influenced. And it's our job to try to prevent that influence. And really the only way we can do that is hold forth the truth, contend earnestly for the faith. Know it, teach it, stand on it, and live it. But it's not just enough in our what to do that personally I try to live a certain way, which I should do, and all of you should do. It, there's got to be more. That's just, just the silent witness is not enough. Okay, so we're going to be reminded it says he wants them to be reminded, and there's Old Testament examples. Um, we're also to remember what the apostles spoke. The apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about the mockers, those that would cause division. But when we look at verse 20, it says, um, what are we to do? There is a main verb, you were told this week, the main verb is keep. So what are we supposed to keep? <laughs> I'll write it up there. Keep yourselves <clears throat> in the love of God. It's in verse 20. And when you go back to verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse 21. When you go back to verse 20, the rest of those that look like verbs are actually participles. And what a participle does is it's like a verb phrase, verb-like phrase that is, or we actually I should call it an ad adverbial phrase. Um, it modifies or gives us more information about the verb. It kind of supports the verb. So when we're when the main verb is keep yourself in the love of God, then we can go back at these participles and see how do we do that. And it says one of them is building. in the most holy faith. So building yourself up in the most holy faith is one. What's the next one? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Holy okay, praying in the Holy Spirit. And then what's the last one? Would it be having mercy on those who are doubting? Um, or not? I, no? I it, it, that's, a, that's a next command. So it's the waiting okay. anxiously for the mercy. Okay. Of Jesus to eternal life. So building praying and waiting are the participles that modify or, or help support keep or tell us how we are to keep ourselves in the love of God. Um, it's a little bit of an English lesson there, a little grammar lesson there to understand. But the next one is we are to have mercy. So it's another command.
And, and then it also, the next one is we're to save. Snatching them out of the fire. Again, that's a, a, a um, participle. And then the last is we're to have mercy without fear. So just from Jude, these are the things that we are, that we're told to do. What are we to do? We're to remember, we're to keep, we're to have mercy, we're to save, and we're also to have mercy. Um, just to put it very simply, but we need to look at each of these, obviously. And we did a lot of cross-referencing. So when it talks about keeping yourself in the love of God, in some of our cross-referencing, we saw there's this connection between um, when Jesus says, if you love me, what am I going to do? If I love Jesus, what am I going to do? What does he say? Abide in him. Abide in him. Right. Abide. Which is have our abode in him, have our housing, our, our, our living in him. What else were you saying? Oh, in John 15. <laughs> yes, John 15. It's awesome. Awesome. So we're to abide in him. And there's, I love the connection or the picture of the vine. You know, he is the vine. We are the branches and we're to keep by being connected, um, living in him, that abiding in him. Um, and he also says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And, he, and then he starts kind of pulling these together and saying, if we abide in him, then the love of God is in us. And if we keep his commandments, then the love of God is in us. And I mean, it all starts interconnecting. So love, abiding, and obey, obedience all are interchangeable. They're, they're different aspects, but you can't separate them. And it was one of those things that as a Christian and as someone I began, as I began to study to, to kind of break away sometimes from what you might hear a lot. And I mean, in church, like even in teaching, and I'm not saying they're wrong as much as I'm saying, maybe I just didn't pick up on this nuance, but I would not have told you that Jesus had commandments. I mean, he doesn't, God of the Old Testament, the God, the Father, you know, you know, Moses coming down with the tablets and all that. Yeah, I got that one. But I didn't, most of the time, Jesus is not portrayed that way. In, in most of our teaching, it's all about love. And it's what we think of as love, which is feeling, which is, which is great. I love the feeling of love. Don't get me wrong. But Love is so much more than just a feeling because if it's a feeling, feelings go away. I mean, if, if in any individual moment, it's any truth is just based on my, my feelings, then anger can be part of that or frustration or love or not so much love, <laughs> a lot of dislike, let's say. Um, and, and God isn't variable like that. You know, God is love. He's the literal definition of love. And he doesn't ever stop being love, even when he is expressing wrath, even when he is pronouncing condemnation. Any of the things that we would call negative and unloving, which God can't be, he is 100,000% love and he's 100,000% justice and he's 100,000%. He's all of these, all of them, 100% all the time, unlike us. And that's where it gets a little uh, fuzzy is we project onto him how we are. I'm angry, therefore I'm not real loving, feeling the love right now, or I'm loving and you know, all that anger just kind of goes away. And I, I go from one to the other. Um, it's much, much harder to be that consistent agape, agape that God is. But we have it in us, and we can. 
So as we look at what we are to do, remember overall, we're trying to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Faith, what is faith? Faith is believing in God in such a way that it changes us completely. And now there is an expression of it coming out of us. That now we live in it and we walk in it. But remember, faith was a gift from God. Not something I had in me until he gave it to me. So my salvation is completely based on faith. And that faith was completely given to me by God. And it's in somebody, which is Jesus Christ. And it's in what Jesus Christ did. So it's a belief about something, you know, holding to those truths. And it changes us. If you're or anyone is not changed by those truths, then you don't have faith. I mean, that's, that's just the long and the short of it. Um, so these people... That, were, that we need to contend earnestly for the faith are denying our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. That's a biggie. And in denying him, they're denying what he did and they're denying his rulership, his authority, just like it says later, they reject authority. It says they turn the grace of God into licentiousness. I just talked about faith being a gift Grace is a gift. That's the, the definition of it. And they're saying, because I have salvation, which they don't have, but they think they do, because I'm saved, I can live however I want. I've got that fire insurance policy. I'm not going to go to hell. And I get to live however I want, which is not anywhere like we just said. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll abide in me as I abide with the Father, and the Father will be in you, and I will be in you. Okay, can a person who has that connection to Jesus break God's ways and rules? And I mean majorly and consistently. Can we all? Yes. We'll raise our hand to that. Yes. Any individual one of us can sin, but not as a pattern of life not constantly and consistently, not knowingly, we can't. But even though we were given everything pertaining to life and godliness at our salvation, sanctification is a process. <laughs> Always want to remember that. And we're to get more and more and more like Jesus. But we got to be connected to him from the start and continually in order for that to happen. So we are to remember, we're to keep ourselves in the love of God. We've talked about obedience. We've talked about abiding. That's all connected to the love. We build, we are building ourselves up in the most holy faith. How do we do that? What are some practical things we can do to build ourselves up in the faith? Stay in the word. Study it. Absolutely. I think that's absolutely number one. And when you hear someone saying something and you're not, eh, that's because you've been reading the word and studying it. I agree. I agree. We, it's the idea of um, when, you know, the plumb line is what precept used for the longest time. And if you've ever hung wallpaper and used a plumb bob, you do that to see if your wallpaper is straight <laughs> up and down right? Otherwise, if you're hanging a picture or anything else, you might use a level to see if it's straight. So you've got to have a standard, which is God's word. And that standard is the straight and narrow. And if you're off from that, you have to get back in alignment with it. And that takes being in the word. And it takes consistently being in the word, you know, reading, studying, like you were saying, hearing, um, I love the uh, the picture of the five, the hand because I can remember five things, right? <laughs> Reading, hearing, like a, a message or discussion like we're doing today, lecture from Kay or whoever, your pastor or whoever, Sunday school teacher, meditating, memorizing, and studying. Those are the five like disciplines related to the Bible. Prayer I use as the bracelet. 
meaning it surrounds it all, because that is definitely something that is really critical. But if I'm, some of you have seen me do this, if I'm trying to do one of those, I'm not real balanced. It's, I can get it balanced, but I really can't do much without this maybe falling off. And certainly it can be snatched away. Two is a little more balanced, still teetering, if you can see that, and be easy to snatch it away. Three, I'm getting, that's much more balanced. I'm doing a whole lot better, but if I get all five involved, I can do a lot. You've seen waiters and waitresses carrying big trays of stuff this way, and they can do things without hardly even looking. You know, really balanced, but it's still easy for it to fall off or be taken. What I love to think of is the application being across your palm and sticking that in those five fingers. Now you can't take it away from me if I'm applying it and if I'm covering the whole thing in prayer. That's from the navigators, by the way. I like to give credit for credits too. <laughs> uh, I think I added the application part, by the way, and I might have added the prayer part, but um, building ourselves up in our most, ho most holy faith. Remember, faith is given to us to, in order for us to get saved. We don't have it in us, but once it's given to us, we have it. And once it's in us, it's something that we are to do to keep on keeping on keep on in this faith keep on growing more and more like jesus and those five things i talked about the application and the prayer are, are all part of what it takes to build be building be building being built up <laughs> in the faith uh, how many bees is that okay another is where to be praying in the spirit as i've already talked about um when it says praying in the Holy Spirit, how's that different? Is it different? What do you think about when I say praying in the Holy Spirit? I'll give you a hint. Um, radical concept that I heard a long time ago is when we think about prayer, we think about a time that we stop, close our eyes, either someone else is praying and we're praying along with them, or we are praying silently or out loud. That's usually what we think about, right? Um, just kind of simply, right? Do you realize that if it's truly prayer, that God has initiated it through the Holy Spirit? It is a conversation, con meaning with, C-O-N, verse meaning verbal, words, Take the, break the word down, con means with. It's not a monologue. It's not me talking to God because I'm so great. Mm -hmm. It's me responding. And, and a lot of that comes from like what Martha was saying, when we read the word, it, 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 it makes us respond. I mean, it causes that response. The Holy Spirit can guide us through it and we can pray it back. If you want to pray in the whole, in the will of God, pray his word. Don't, don't twist it and make it what you want it to say, but just respond to it. Pray the prayers, the, pray the promises that he's given. But praying in the Holy Spirit is knowing it's initiated by God through the Holy Spirit and by the Holy Spirit, we're gonna be praying back to God. And even then the Holy Spirit's gonna take it and make it what it needs to be and take it to God and, and, and cause changes in us so that we will pray that way. So praying in the Holy Spirit is a big deal. And the last is the, not the last, but the third one is waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. What are we waiting on? What is our hope? Our hope is for that eternal life, but it's for the return of Jesus. Either before we die and we're going to be caught up in a cloud and then come back with him to when he comes fully to earth or 
it's going to be, or, or we're going to die and we're going to be there. And then we're going to be reunited with a body at his rapture. And then we're going to come back with him when he fully returns. Revelation 19, when he fully returns, we're with him. Fully returns to the earth. Um, that's what we're waiting anxiously for. In this time of year, you can understand this better than probably almost any other time of the year. Because, I mean, we're, we're all too old to be that excited about the gifts under the tree. But we remember being a kid. Or hopefully you're going to have some youngsters around. And think about Christmas Eve. And think about what they're thinking about. I know it's all about greed. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> That's not the best thing. But they're waiting anxiously for that morning, right? They're waiting with eager anticipation. They know it's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. They don't know. They think they know. They hope they know. They've given their lists or whatever. That's the kind of anticipation we need to be waiting anxiously. It's a glorious thing when Jesus returns. It's the culmination of everything. And it's a doing away with what we're dealing with now. It's the best of the best. We just don't know when the 25th is going to be. <laughs> you know, we always know Christmas morning is on the 25th. We don't know when that day is going to be for the past 2,000 years. People need, we need to be living each moment with this eager anticipation for his return. Some people call it eye to the sky, ready to fly. I am waiting eagerly. And if we're not careful, it's real easy to get real comfortable here, to enjoy too much. I, I want you to enjoy, but to too much enjoy this world this world's pleasures, this world's stuff, material stuff. Even when I gave the Christmas analogy, it's awful because usually it's too much. But we, we can enjoy that. God gives us this to enjoy. But this is nowhere near what we're going to be able to enjoy someday. So we're waiting anxiously for that mercy that we do not deserve of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Now, then it turns and it says, have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some, have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. So this is our responsibility to the others around us. Remember, there are those who have crept in unnoticed, but there's also others there that Maybe you're there, like maybe they've been brought there by their parents. Maybe it's just the thing to do because all their lives they've gone to church. Maybe, and, I, and I'm just using a church analogy. This, there could be other situations, but church is probably the easiest and best to bring this to. Um, there's some that are doubting. Before your salvation, did you ever doubt? Yeah. Had questions at least. I, I, can, I can say I never didn't believe in the existence of God. I can say that. I, I just know that's a doubt I never had. And I'm, I'm glad for that. But I know there's plenty that do have questions or um, come up with some really weird things. There's others that need to be snatched out of the fire. I mean, they're obviously not saved <laughs> and they need to be snatched. We need to grab them. Um, if you saw a toddler walking towards a campfire, you wouldn't casually go, well, let's just see how this goes. <laughs> You'd snatch him by the arm. A, a toddler that runs out into a parking lot, you know, it may look actually almost like child abuse if you grab their arm and jerk them, but you're trying to save their life. That's the idea here. Um, and then the, ha on some, have mercy with fear hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. What do you think that means? I mean, you've got mercy on some that are doubting, but here it's mercy without, I'm sorry, with fear. I shouldn't say without fear. I knew that didn't sound right. Have mercy with fear. Now, obviously we're not talking about fear of condemnation. You did your cross-referencing this week. Love, perfect love casts out fear. 
if we are in the love of Christ and abiding in that love and have the love of God in us as a result of that, we do not fear condemnation. That I mean, we don't have any fears, but we do not fear condemnation. But if we're going to talk to someone whose garment is polluted by the flesh, they're defiling the flesh, remember that, and they've turned the grace of God into licentiousness, and we're going to that person, why do we need to fear? What would this mean? I think uh, we have to fear God more than we fear men. That's a good one. Yeah. So we're going to have mercy with fear, meaning the fear of God. I like that. Um, because we need to do what God wants us to do in that situation, rather than what that person might not like hearing from us. Very good. Any other? I think there's various ways we can look at this, and I think that's a good one. When, when we're told in scripture to not judge, which is one of the most quoted verses now, it's basically, it, what it's saying, uh, I wish I remember the reference, it's one of Paul's epistles, but he says, uh, don't judge lest you be judged. And in Romans, it says over and over and over again that they've got these leaders, the Jewish leaders that were teaching, don't do this and don't do that while they were doing it themselves. So if we're going to someone to point out their garment polluted by the flesh, their fleshly behavior, we better be going without it being in us. You know, the whole speck in my eye, log in theirs or log in mine, speck in theirs. Sorry, I got that wrong. Um, you know, we don't go and point out, point our finger in somebody's face and call them out on something that we're doing. I think that's one of the fears that we need to have. And I think the other, another is we, it's easier to drag me down than it is for me to pull them up. So we don't go into these situations thinking we can handle it. You know, don't go to a, a wild rock and immoral party and participate and think that we can handle that because we're going to be pulled right into their behavior. So there's fear in that sense. But I, I think the, what you said about the fear of God is, is fantastic because we need to be ready to talk to these people because God wants us to. And we care more about that relationship than we care about whether these people like us or not. I definitely think that's very much a part of this. Okay, so we're to have mercy on some who are doubting. We're to save others, snatching them out of the fire. These people are obvious. We need to try to pull them back, do our part, and have mercy with fear on those whose garments are polluted by the flesh. And we hate that garment polluted by the flesh. You know, again, the, the contrast between loving God and, and hating things that God hates. Now, what is God going to be able to do? What is God going to do? He is able. What's he able to do? From stumbling. Keep me yes, from he's able to keep me from stumbling. What else? Keeping me from false teachers. Yes, he can definitely do that because we saw that over and over in Second Peter is noticing that there's false teachers and false prophets and he can show us that truth again in if we're contending for the faith and we're building ourselves up in the faith, we're going to notice that difference. Um, the next one it says in verse 24 is he's able to make me stand in the presence of his glory. He makes us blameless. Right. Great joy. Yes, blameless with great joy. And with your cross references this week, over and over and over, we saw this, you know, blameless, being presented blameless, spotless, 
uh, without blemish, you know, the idea of the, the bride in her white garments, the lamb without spot, uh, holy and blameless over and over in First Thessalonians, Ephesians, First Corinthians, just over and over and over. Do you ever stop and just let that word sit for just a second? I mean, I think everybody here, I think all of you are moms, right? Is everybody a mom? Okay. Number one, as soon as you become a mom, guilt. <laughs> you wonder if you're doing anything right. You wonder if you're going to raise them right. You wonder how they're going to turn out. You, you feel badly about your, you know, frustrations, anger, emotions that are involved. And I, I just, I mean, I kind of laugh, I almost make it too funny that guilt is like, part of the package of being a parent. But just think about it for a second. If you truly are ha in the middle of something that is not good or think back to a time prior to salvation or at any given time where you were truly guilty, like maybe even illegally guilty, think of that moment of feeling, having all of that taken away just cleansed and that baptism image of you go under the water dying to old and you come out renewed and afresh and facing and walking forward I don't I know that God puts my sins as far away as he can and he can go a long way from the east to the west, that's eternal east to eternal west, he can separate me from my sins. That's wonderful. But I also know I remember them, but I shouldn't feel condemned by them. And if I am, it's a work of Satan. That's one of his trademarks. But I should have come under conviction about it. I should have repented of them and confessed them. That's part of my salvation. But I believe the reason we continue to, a good reason that we could continue to remember is if we literally had that scrubbed from our brains, we would think we'd never done anything wrong. We would think we were pretty good. And it gives us that compassion and remembrance for someone else that might be caught up in that or something else, but we can remember our guilt. But now, he is able to make me stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy. That burden, my, my daughter is uh, fostering this girl, um, wonderful girl, we love her. And she just got saved a couple, I mean, she got saved uh, back in June, I think, but she just got baptized. And I, we're, we were listening to her testimony as she was going through the baptism. And she, 12 years old, in her words, talked about that burden being just falling away. That when she realized what, you know, when Sophie explained it to her, she, just, she talked about that burden falling off. It's a perfect picture of our salvation. And that burden was put on Jesus and not just mine. He would have done it just for me, not just mine, but all sin for all time. That's weighty. But instead we get to stand with our shoulders back and we get to stand in his presence, realizing that all the prophets, you think about Isaiah what is Isaiah's response when he was standing, at least in the spirit, standing in the presence of God? He's like, oh, me of unclean lips. Or the ones that fall on their faces when they're in the presence of like John in Revelation. John, who used to lean against Jesus's breast. John, who walked with Jesus for three and a half years. John falls flat on his face in the presence of a glorified Jesus. That's the picture that we would have of, of but we instead, each time they were told to stand up. And the only way we can stand is he makes me stand.
not like forces me to do it, but he makes it possible for me to stand. Blameless. There's no way I can be blameless except for that he took it all. But does that not bring you great joy? It does. To our only God and Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Even in these last words, think about what has been um, contrasted by these ungodly. It says here, to, to God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ be majesty. Remember, they revile angelic majesties. Now, Jesus is much more than an angelic majesties, but he has majesty. Jesus, Father and Son. Dominion and authority, they reject authority. They deny our only Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. They've, this is the contrast. And no matter what they do or what they think or what they say, what is true is God has glory, majesty, dominion, and authority forever, past, now, and forever. Before all time, now, and forever. Amen. So what are we to do? You looked at it through your lesson, all your cross-referencing here in Jude. We saw some last week. What is our responsibility? It's not enough to be. It's not enough to be saved. It's not enough to be a Christian. We are to be doing these things to build ourselves up, to be ready. But remember, it's not just for me. It's for the work that God has for me to do, which is always going to be in ministry to others. So one of our responsibilities is to tell the unsaved the truth, but it's also to protect the flock that we're among because these have crept in unnoticed. Not these, these have crept in unnoticed. And they're turning the grace of God into licentiousness and denying our only master and Lord. These are deadly things that they're doing and the influence they could have on the some and the others and some others, I'm just trying to think of the different uh, references, some again, the influence is huge. We may be the only voice that's going to speak out. Yes, we need to do it in love. And our goal needs to be any of these things, mercy, snatching, helping with their doubts, fearing but wanting them to not be polluted by the, the garment that's polluted by the flesh, hating that garment. Yes, all of those. But our goal is for salvation for truth to be told, for protection of those who are vulnerable and leave if, 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 their, if their eternal punishment is certain already marked out beforehand, then we've done what we need to do and we leave it to God. So good study, wasn't it? <laughs> Jude is a good and timely, it's amazingly timely book. And it's so short, 25 verses. It's incredible how much is packed into here and how often it's just kind of passed by on the way to Revelation. <laughs> here it is right here, um, the shortest of the epistles. One of the shorter of the epistles, I should say, not maybe the shortest because some of the John, yeah, John 3, 3rd John is only 14 verses. So there's some, that are shorter. I hope that it has been an impactive study for you. I hope it's um, brought some, if nothing else, the comfort as you went through some of the other scriptures, um, certainty of condemnation for those who, I mean, I, there's a phrase in Revelation that says this, and you have to figure out what the this is, but this is the perseverance of the saints. And the this each time is eternal judgment for those who aren't saints. Well, I think I'm right about that. It, I know at least in most times. This, knowing that there's a certainty to it, 
knowing that God is going to come and he is going to bring culmination to all of this. That's what keeps us going. Because sometimes we look around and we don't see justice. Sometimes we look around and we wonder why, why is God allowing things? I mean, it's okay to question that part, but certainly to take it back to him and come to understanding, but it's hard. And the things that were promised, as I was just reading in Romans the other day, were, tr were promised tribulation, were promised uh, persecution, were promised that as things get worse and worse towards the end, that even family is going to turn against us and turn us in possibly. Um, I know, I don't know if y'all heard any of this. I didn't hear of specific cases, but apparently there were people over, let's say Thanksgiving that were encouraged if they saw too many cars at their neighbor's house to turn them in. That's where we are today. And that's um, maybe a minor thing. I don't know what would have happened to them. But if a governor has said only so many people gathering together, then you're breaking the governor's law, if it's even a law, if you're gathering more than that many people. Scary times. But there will come times, we, have, we don't have them in the United States, but there have been all over the world where your loved, what you think are your loved ones, think that you can count on, may turn you in, may turn you in to save their skin, but they may turn you in and you may go to prison and you may go to punishment. I mean, to like torture and death. And that has happened. Martyrs have happened for a long, long time. That may be coming. I hope not. I hope Jesus will come before that, but it may come here to the United States. So you need to be thinking now when it's not happening, what are you going to do in that time? What are you going to do in that moment? And if we're allowing these people to creep in and influence our local churches, how strong is that local church going to be to stand by you? Probably not very strong, unfortunately. Okay, we will stop and we'll watch the video in a minute. And I will be giving you some information by email. Um, if you've been getting my emails, then you know I've got your email um, and about when we start again. And we'll be doing a study on Ruth. I think it's the Kinsman Redeemer study. I think it's what we decided to start. And then we'll go into something else after that. But I'll give you a heads up about that. Um, and we'll close in prayer. Gracious and kind, Heavenly Father, the Father that does have all glory and all majesty and all dominion and all authority. And we're, that is what we know we can count on. Therefore, that is what we know that gives us comfort is to know that you do have all of that. Even when we look around us and our circumstances, our situation, our world, our country, whatever we're looking at is in uproar and upheaval. Even if in this moment we're sitting in peace, we know it's going on out there. So we just ask, Father, that you would help us have your peace within us to know that you will keep us from stumbling, meaning you will keep us from stumbling into sin. You will keep us, you can keep us from that and do. We can deny that and mess up, but we can't say that we can't not. We cannot say that we don't have the ability to not do whatever sin it is that we might tell ourselves that we just don't have the willpower because you will keep us from stumbling and you will make us stand blameless. But we won't be blameless if we're continuing, if, if behavior is defiling of the flesh. Help us to see that Father around us and in mercy and in love to reach out and tell the people that we love and that we care about, that we like, maybe that we barely know, that their behavior is not the behavior, if they're claiming to be Christians, the behavior is not the behavior of a Christian. 
if they're of the world, we just tell them the difference. The difference and what their thinking is and what the truth of God is and, and preach the gospel. When I said earlier that we don't judge them, meaning they're going to act as the world acts. And we expect that. But we are still to then know and have it so obvious that we would share the gospel. For those who call themselves Christians and are not living according to your word, we are to judge them and we are to say something. And we're even sometimes to put them away from our fellowship for a time, hoping that they would see the difference and hoping that they would restore and want to restore. We have a responsibility, Father. You have given it to us. You've given us these ministries and you've given us this word that we can't turn away from because now we know it. We just ask that you will help us see those times. Give us the words as I know you will. Your spirit is in us and your spirit will speak through us. We ask that you will help us to do these things like praying in your spirit, allowing you to initiate and us to respond. That we would be building ourselves up. We would be doing the things that you have caused us to want to do because you said in your new covenant that you would write your word on our hearts. You'd write your law on our hearts and you would cause us to want to know you and to be with you. And first, second, and third John talked about, talks about that, that we would want to be with other Christians, that we would want to be in your word. You cause that in us. And that we're waiting anxiously for the undeserved ability to be with you eternally and for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking to the sky ready to fly. And as we advent and, and focus on the birth of your son, we also want to always remember that he grew up and he died and he was resurrected and he ascended and he's coming again. That we look forward to that more than we look forward to the flurry of paper all over the room as gifts are being opened. Keep us in your truth and in the season and for the reason of it. We thank you for that as well. Keep us as we go apart, bring us back together in January for our new study, and let us have a healthy, wonderful time as we celebrate the birth of your son. And we thank you for it, ask for it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Merry Christmas. Thank you, thank you Peggy. Merry Christmas to you too.